Hi, I'm Michael Byrne. I got involved in tile setting as a mosaic artist whose work was falling apart. And I thought that if I took a job with a journeyman setter for about six months, I'd have all the skills I'd need to know. But here it is 17 years later, and I'm still finding out new ways to set tile and new materials. And these two samples here represent what I feel are the best choice for either the professional or the do-it-yourselfer. This one here is the thin bed method, while this one over here is the traditional thick bed method. Now the thin bed method is composed of a number of different layers. If I turn this on the side, you can see the resulting sandwich that we have. We have a good sturdy plywood base, our laminating thin set, the backer board, more thin set, the membrane, the final layer of thin set, and then the tile. We've got a real rigid base. It's not going to flex. And with the addition of the membrane, it's not going to leak. This represents a real good way to go for a do-it-yourselfer. Now, the thick bed method, on the other hand, it requires more skill and more labor. But it also starts off with our three-quarter plywood base. But the next layer is just a layer of cold-applied asphalt gum. This is used to bond the 15-pound felt paper, which is going to act as a waterproofing membrane and an isolation membrane. Now, on top of the 15-pound felt paper, we have a layer of reinforcing mesh, which actually strengthens the mortar bed and protects it from cracking. Then the countertop itself is filled in with deck mud, which is a dry, crumbly mortar mix. A layer of thin set is applied to this, and finally the tiles are set into the thin set. While both of these represent very strong installations, durable, waterproof, this tape is going to concentrate on the thin set method. A thin set job like this allows you to get started tiling immediately, and then as you build up your confidence, you can move on to more difficult work. Now before we get started, here's an overview of the procedures we'll be covering in the tape. Before we can deal with the specifics of this countertop, we need to talk about countertop layout in general. And the first thing that comes to my mind is the sink itself. It's the focal point of the entire countertop. And there are a number of sinks that you can choose for your installation. Of course, the easiest way is to get a self-trimming sink, which overlaps the tile. To install that, you merely cut a hole for the sink, run the tile right up to the edge of the hole, plop the sink in place, and you're in business. But there are a number of drawbacks with that type of sink. Mainly, it creates a dam around the edge of the sink. Now, instead, what I like to do is overlap the sink with the tiles. And what you get with that situation is 
the sink effectively extends outward to the entire area covered by the countertop. That way everything that's on the countertop can find its way into the drain easily without having to jump over a, any kind of a dam. Now to trim out the sink we have a number of options. We can use a piece of quarter round, but since it requires a raised bed, we won't be able to use it on this countertop. We could also use a piece of radius bullnose, and it too sits on a raised bed. And since we're going to be using the backer board for this countertop, what we'll be trimming the sink out with is the surface bullnose. That'll give us a nice smooth edge easy to maintain. Now, the next thing on the countertop that needs to be trimmed is this front edge. And here again you have a number of options. You can screw a piece of wood trim along the face of this. You can use a piece of surface bullnose with another piece of tile in front cut to the height of the front apron. But the kind of trim I like to use on a countertop is V-cap. It covers the top and the face of the counter with one piece. Now, it's important when you're tiling a countertop to be really mindful of the number of cuts and the position of cuts that will be located on the countertop. And it's important that you don't put the cuts up here on the front where you're going to be leaning. If you have to cut a piece of tile to fit, put that cut along the backsplash area where it can be hidden by the backsplash tiles. Now having said all that, it's almost inevitable that you're going to have some cut tiles somewhere along the countertop. But you want to keep those cut tiles to a minimum. And if possible, you want to eliminate any tiles less than half size because they look skinny and next to the full tiles, they throw off the balance of the, of the countertop. To help me lay out the tiles, I could use feet and inches, but they're much too cumbersome to use, so instead, I use the dimension of a single tile plus the grout joint. Now these tiles here that we'll be setting on the countertop are standard four and a quarter tiles. And they have a built-in spacing lug. And when stacked next to another one, they give me a grout joint of about a 32nd of an inch, which is a little bit too narrow for what I want. So instead, I'll use one of these eighth inch spacers to space the tiles out, and that'll give me the joint that I like. Now, a single tile and a single grout joint is not going to be too much help in laying out the countertop. So instead, I spread out an array of tiles against a straight edge, and then space them out with the spacers, and then transfer the location of the grout joints onto this little board called a jury stick. This gives me the location of each grout joint. And to make it more flexible, I have it marked on either side so that I can go into the left or right side of the wall. Now let's see how this thing works. The first problem we have with laying out this countertop is that it shares certain areas with the shower next door. This pony wall and the backsplash wall. Now, since this has already been laid out, most of our attention has been focused on this window. And its position on the wall will dictate the position of the tiles here on the countertop from left to right. Now, looking at the lines, you can see that we're fairly well balanced between the two sides of the sink. It's not the ideal situation I'd like. These tiles are both going to be less than half size, but they're balanced, and that's important. Now, consider the alternative. If the grout joint came down here, 
and not a full tile, it just wouldn't look integral. On the other hand, since I do have some flexibility in the positioning of the tile here on the pony wall, I'm going to make this grout joint line between the V-cap and the field tile dictate the tile's positioning here and on here. Now before committing myself, I can check this layout with the jury stick. Lined up here, here. I have a full tile here, plus room for the setting bed on the back wall. May have to do a little trimming on that one. Full tile here, full tile here, space for the setting bed. I developed these lines with a level off of the tick marks. One other thing I need to mention on this backsplash, since we brought our layout from the shower over to the countertop area, we left here with a space that is real close to half size. And once any kind of setting bed is installed on the plywood top, that's going to be reduced, which is one of the reasons why I'm going to be putting the backer board down on the top rather than the much thicker mortar bed, which would make this piece of tile even smaller. Normally, I don't go into this much detail until the setting beds are in place, and I try to confine the rough layout to the perimeter of the installation. But to show you the relationship between the layout and its surroundings, I've done it ahead of time. Now let's get the backer boards in place. I've taken the dimensions of the countertop and transferred them to a piece of backer board. And as you can see, I've got the right side and the left side and the rear piece already cut out. And in fact, you can see also that I've cut the rabbits out so that once the sink is placed on top, it will be flush with the surface of the backer board. Now, there are a number of ways that this material can be cut. The simplest way is just with a utility knife and the backer board is treated just like drywall. The idea here is you want to cut through the reinforcing mesh, snap it, take your knife, and you cut through the bottom reinforcing mesh as well. Now the method that I prefer is to use a dry cutting diamond blade. This one is mounted in a just a regular disc grinder. Now while this blade is a real good method for cutting the backer board, it's pretty dangerous. This rotates at very high speed, it throws a lot of chips. The reason I'm outside is that this blade creates a terrific amount of dust and I don't want to make a big mess inside. Cutting out this rabbit is really a roughing operation. First thing I want to do is to slip through the reinforcing mesh and go about as deep as the rim of the sink is thick. For cutting the edge, the side of the blade will actually prevent the blade from dropping too deeply into the board. And by cutting that rabbit first, I eliminate a lot of clamping problems. Here the rabbit is finished, I can just cut the piece away from the larger section of backer board. Well, just a little touch-up, and we'll see how this thing fits. I'll be talking more about thinset later, but for now, it's going to be used as the laminating material between the backer board and the plywood. And here I'm remixing it after it has been slaking for about 10 minutes. Now, whether you're using it for tile or backer boards, the application is more or less the same. First, you spread the thin set out with the flat portion of the trowel. Once the area is covered, then you use the notch portion of the trowel to establish a uniform height. Once the thin set is all combed out, I can begin putting in the pre-cut pieces of backer board. And it's not good enough to just put them up on the surface. You've got to position them and push them in hard. I'll cover the seams created by neighboring pieces of backer board with the fiberglass reinforcing tape. 
sink is here now just to help me position the backer boards. I'll attach those with drywall screws about every six to eight inches and make sure the heads are below the top surface. Before I can install the membrane, I'll have to lift the sink out and then run a bead of butyl caulk around the rabbet. And after the sink is replaced, that butyl caulk becomes a, a real important part of the waterproofing. Now let's take the dimensions of the countertop and transfer them to the piece of noble seal. Okay, I've outlined the countertop on this piece of noble seal, but if I were to cut it on this line, the top of the countertop would be waterproofed, but there would be nothing to stop water from leaking down around the edge. So to prevent that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a little bit to each of the sides. Pre-folding this material produces flat, even surfaces. Noble Seal TS is a three-ply membrane used for thinset work, and it is designed to allow the tiles to move independently of the substrate. Now, the CPE stands for chlorinated polyethylene, and it forms the central core. To each face of the CPE is bonded a mat of spun polyester fibers. These fibers grip into the thinset, and allow tiles to be set on the membrane and the membrane to be bonded to the substrate. Okay, I've already pre-folded a piece for our countertop and you can see that I have got my envelope folds already made. Now right here you can see where I've outlined the position of the sink. This is critical, so I don't want to cut this out until the whole piece has been positioned. Now let's go up and see how this thing fits. In the background you can see more noble seal on the pony wall and some 15 pound felt paper which will waterproof the mortar bed on the walls tape. The backsplash membrane needs to overlap the membrane I'm installing now. Now in addition to waterproofing the top, once the 15 pound felt paper is put on the wall, we have a nice watershed here. Anything that hits this backsplash wall will run right down onto this membrane and into the sink where it belongs. Now let's stick it down with some thinset. The texture of the thinset and the method of application I'm using here is the same as I used for the backer boards. In these shots here, you can see how useful the short end of the notch trowel is for getting into tight places. By the time I'm finished, all the surfaces will be combed. This bead of butyl caulk is really important. When it combines with that that's oozed out from underneath the sink, it'll glue the membrane to the lip of the sink. And if you're going to get a leak on the countertop, that's where it's going to happen. This gets a little haphazard, but it just takes a little bit of straightening out to get the main portion of the membrane situated. And I use everything, my fingertips, my forearms, the palm of my hand, to stretch it out and smooth it, get the air bubbles out. And once it is positioned, I use a short straight edge to get all the air out and really press the membrane into the thin set. The manufacturer recommends a roller, but I think I get better results out of the straight edge. In addition to getting out the excess air, you want to use the straight edge to get out the excess thin set as well. To keep the box folds nice and flat against the wall, I'll back butter them with some thin set, and then to keep the membrane from being shifted out of position, I'll hold down with a straight edge and squeegee out with the margin trail. A few staples here will hold this in place, and I can waterproof the heads of the staples with a dab of butyl. And I'll hear them squeezing out the air and thin set. That excess material will be cut away once the thin set has hardened. It's a good idea before cutting to feel around with your fingers to the edge of the sink and make sure that the layout line is in the right place.
and then very carefully I slit through the membrane and pick it up from the sink. Now, when it's properly laminated to a plywood substrate, backerboard can make a durable and functional countertop material. But there are sometimes I think that a mortar bed makes a better choice. And that's why I've built this mock up here. It represents one cabinet with a hole cut out for a cooking element. And the cabinet next to it, which as you can see, is three eighths of an inch higher than this cabinet. In addition, both of these cabinets are out of level. Now, carpentry can repair these problems, but for me, the mortar bed is the easiest way to go. Now, I'm going to be floating a mortar bed similar to this on this mock-up to take care of this problem and the out-of-level condition. Now, over here, I've assembled all the materials I'm going to be using. I've pre-cut a 15-pound felt paper membrane. Right here, I have the sink metal. You can see where I've mitered it to make that bend. And then over here I have the chicken wire with staples in my staple gun. And, and here I have a piece of 9 gauge galvanized wire that I've pre-bent to fit around the cooktop opening. Now the purpose of this section is to demonstrate the techniques needed to float a mortar bed. So I'm going to prepare this top and we can get right to that. Well, I have the top all prepared. Let me point out a few things. First of all, it's just the tar paper stuck down with asphalt gum. To set the sink metal, I started over here by nailing through one of these adjustment slots and then leveling this section. Then run a level across this piece here when I had to add another piece. And to get it level, I just bridged this with a level, held half on this and half on that, nail it in place. Back here, you're going to have to imagine that there's a wall across here. But the point I want to illustrate with this piece of tar paper is that when you're waterproofing a deck surface like this, always lap the paper up the wall. And that way, you have a nice bowl-shaped effect to the membrane, and it holds the water on the countertop. Now, I need two level surfaces to screed off the excess mud. I have one that I can use over here. but. The second one I'm going to make out of a strip of wood and just put it in place temporarily and level it over a pile of mud. This is deck mud. It's just a mixture of Portland cement and sand. Now the consistency of this mud is dry. In fact, you know when you have the right mix when you squeeze it into a ball and it sticks together. And it has that dry pack consistency so that I can literally ram it down into all the voids in this countertop. Now, first thing I want to do is build up a column of mud that I can put my float strip on. I keep my float strips soaking in water. If they're dry when they contact the mud, they have a tendency to bow upward. And all I have to do is place my spirit level on the float strip. Looks like it's about a half inch higher than the edge of the rail. And then just tap it into position. That's perfect. Now once that's done, I can begin packing the mortar onto the surface. And I begin out in the rail, and I use an old wood float to back up the sink metal so I can get the mud in real tight. Now at this point I want to slip in the piece of 9 gauge because I want to center this roughly in the middle of the mortar bed. Galvanized wire here really helps to strengthen the narrow cross section and prevent cracking. Now I'll just pack this about a half inch higher than the bed and then I can screed everything off. You can see here that to keep the float strip from getting bumped out of position, I'm using the sawed-off wood float again. Now, because of the moisture content of deck mud, 
it's really important for the success of the setting bed that you ram the entire surface as hard as you can, pack the mud together. Now to cut the excess off, I use an aluminum straight edge and to get started I just loosen the mud at each one of my level points and then gradually ease the straight edge downward into the mortar. Now once the mortar begins to build up behind the straight edge, I just take my flat trowel and cut it away. straight edge off the front sink metal and extend it over to the side area here. Now once I get the main fields loaded, there's a few things that I have to go back and straighten up. The first one is this float strip. And what I need to do is fill that in with mortar. Now, to level this off, I'll use a wood float rather than the straight edge. And I use a circular motion, start off in a small area, and gradually increase it. Now, there are some other spots in the countertop that need fixing, like these voids here. Now, once this bed hardens, it can be tiled in the same way that the backer board and noble seal can be tiled. This particular thin set is a mixture of a liquid latex and Portland cement. And since it is fairly prone to lumps, I'm using the electric mixing paddle. The consistency of thinset will vary depending on the job site conditions, but what you're seeing here is something that's fairly typical. And two important points about mixing thinset is first using the margin trowel to scrape down the dry ingredients from the side of the bucket, and two, keeping the mixing paddle submerged until you're finished mixing. That way you won't introduce air into the mix and possibly weaken it. Now that's just about right. It appears to be a little bit wetter than it should be, but after the slaking period that'll stiffen up a little bit. But it doesn't instantly run off the trowel, but if I shake it a little bit it'll slide off. Now I'll let this sit for a few minutes and then remix and it'll be ready to go. Now we're ready to get started tiling here. And as you can see from the other tape on tiling walls, I've set most of the field tiles on the walls. And that has allowed me to transfer the vertical alignment here on the back wall over to the backsplash using the jury stick. And then from there, I can transfer these marks along the top of the counter. Now to back up a bit, the most important part of the countertop layout is the relationship between the factory edge of a full piece of field tile against the V-cap tile which trims off the front edge. The rest of the layout proceeds towards the rear from this point. Now what we're going to accomplish in this section is first to spread and comb out the thin set. Then we're going to cover the top with all of the full pieces of field tile. Once that's been done, 
I'll need to make cuts for each side of the countertop. Now since their cut edges will be buried by the tiles coming down from the backsplash, I'm going to be using the snap cutter to do that. The trim tiles around the sink, however, need to have a nice smooth edge where they're cut because you're going to have hands running over the top of the countertop. So I'm going to use the wet saw over here, which I've rigged up to use inside. And finally, the tiles along the back have such a small amount that need to be taken off that I can use the biters to do the trimming. Now let's spread some thin set. Now the two most important things about spreading thin set are the size of the notch and the angle at which it's used to spread the thin set. Since I'm familiar with this trowel, let me explain by spreading a little out. First, spread the adhesive, forcing it into the substrate. Now the shallow angle allows me to apply a whole lot more pressure. Once that's been done, I turn it around, make sure the teeth are loaded up, and then I comb out the notches. Now let me show you what happens when I press a piece of tile in place. Let me pick it up. That's what you should see on the back of your piece of tile. Now let me show you what happens when I hold the same trowel at a shallower angle while I'm combing out the notches. Now, you can see that the ridges are fully formed, but now watch what happens when I stick a piece of tile in. See that? Insufficient coverage. That's not really too bad, but it should be full across the whole back of the tile. Now let me recomb this. I'm careful to comb the thin set as close to the lines as possible without obscuring them, since they're going to determine the ultimate location of the tiles. To get started, I'll set the first tile at the intersection of two of the layout lines and then proceed around the perimeter of this panel and then in no particular order I'll fill in the interior of the panel. Okay. Now the placement of the tiles is not the critical issue here. What's more important is to get that thin set covered before it will skin over. Once that's been done I can shift the tiles into their final position. If the layout is done correctly, the spacers should fit snugly without you needing to really cram them in, and they shouldn't just drop right in to the tiles either. If you encounter any of these problems, you'll probably have to do a little shifting of the tile to get the spacers in. The tile spacers are no guarantee that the tiles are going to fit into that panel. And if the tiles are creeping over the line, I'll 